kind of what was the first airplane that you actually put out into production? That would be the S4 Coyote One. When did, when did you, that come in? Oh, that was way back in '83. Uh, you come a long way from that first airplane to what you're doing today. Well, essentially, we have. I mean, uh, that first airplane was like a baby one-seat, uh, two-stroke powered uh, Piper Cub. Uh, what we're standing by right now would be uh, something almost three times the weight, you know, and uh, gross weight, and three times the speed, twice the people. Now, this airplane is what, the uh, S7 Courier? The S7 Courier. It uh, was actually designed in 1985, and um, it was the answer to build a two-seat trainer to our one-seat Coyote. We had started designing a two-seat Coyote uh, which was designated the S6 because the S4 was a uh, tail dragger, the S5 was a trike, and then the S6. And we were a little slow getting that one out of the chute. And I went ahead and whipped up the S7 in the meantime before the 6 came out. So Now, this airplane that I'm looking at today, though, looks a lot different than one that I saw back in 84. Yeah, 85. yeah. This, well, essentially, the cockpit area is pretty much the same. That's always been a big winner. Uh, it's an airplane that's big on the inside, little on the outside, which uh, allows for nice aerodynamic efficiencies. But uh, yeah, you've seen some external changes. We've stretched it, we've increased the tail. Oh my gosh, 40% uh, volume increase to the tail. We stretched the length of the aircraft probably a good uh, 32 inches. But the wing essentially is identical to the aircraft you and I flew back in, uh, probably it was 84, I believe that was. Well, actually, it would have been 85, Dave, because the plane didn't come along until 85, so. Now, that airplane, though, was powered by the two-stroke engine. Yeah, we had a 503 as a base engine, and then uh, the 532 became available, and that was an option we popped in it. And then the 582, and then eventually the 912 and the 912 uh, S, 100 horse. Now, say we were to take that original airplane with, say, a 582 Rotax, and we remove it up into the 912 series of engines, what type of changes would have gone on in the airplane and in the performance? Well, performance-wise, uh, the 582 is surprisingly good anyway because of the light power to weight ratio. Uh, actually, the biggest thing you would see is probably a, a speed increase, a better rate of climb. Uh, over an uh, uh, extended period, the two-stroke would appear to have a better rate of climb initially, and then the uh, four-stroke would catch it up and pass. What kind of cruise speed are we getting out of there? Uh, this is an honest 100 knots. It does 100 knots at about uh, 5 to 5.5 five gallon per hour auto fuel. This was one of the first airplanes that you put into the light sport aircraft, if I remember correctly. Yes, it's, uh, this has been double-strained, as we like to say. Uh, if some of you might remember primary category, which was the biggest offering the FAA had at the time. Uh, it was like the promise of what light sport was supposed to be. And we bid on it and we certified the plane under TP-101 uh, cert rules, uh, such as with Canada uses. And we certified this as primary in 2002. And then uh, in 2005, we certified it again under SLSA. Well, I've been to Europe and a few other countries. I seem to see a lot of your product over there. It's not, you're not just building for the U.S. market, though. Uh, that's right, Dave. We, and uh, a good number of those planes are in Europe. Uh, gosh, Britain, Spain, France, Germany, very popular uh, customers for us, as well as Belgium. Uh, Europe's pretty well populated with our planes, several hundreds of those. And ironically, we did not sell well in the United States until probably the late 90s, and then we started selling better in the United States. Now, how are we bringing this airplane out to the market now? Is it still available, say, as an experimental aircraft, or somebody can build it from a kit, or is it basically just only available as a light sport ready to fly? No, this is a, a full spectrum offering. We have partial kits. You can buy it in seven different kits. You can buy it in the full standard kit. Or you can even buy it in what we call a quick build kit, which is amazing. It's like an almost ready to fly model airplane. Comes covered, painted, uh, you put the guts in it and fly it. And then of course you have the turnkey aircraft where you hand us the money, we hand you the keys. And, and so all those programs are alive and well. Uh, my favorite program, uh, I, I love building kits, but I, there's something nice or there's something uh, very um, romantic about handing a guy keys to a new airplane.
you know, a brand new airplane flying out of Hayes, Kansas, out of our little strip. It, it just is a nice scenario. Oh, this is a real cross-country flyer that you've got here, by the looks of it. Flying out of the backyard fields and stuff like that? The type of flying a guy's going to do in a courier, he's got to be a little more patient. It's a 100-knot airplane. It's not the kind of plane you typically would take across the country, unless you're the guy that, uh, well, like we like to say, if you like flying so much, why are you in such a hurry? And, of course, the courier is the kind of plane you see a spot you want to land, you go ahead and land and enjoy it. It's very short field. It's, it's got plenty of room and capacity. Um, they make a great float plane. There's quite a following uh, with the courier and a little bit of a story about why we call it the courier. I don't know if you ever heard that, but um, one of my favorite airplanes I was very duly impressed by was the Helio Courier. When I was a young child at air shows, I'd see that plane do the demo where it'd fly by at a snail's pace and then come back through zoom. And I was so excited about that that someday I wanted to have a plane like that. So uh, the courier kind of imitates that performance. And I actually would do that same routine at air shows myself with the, the early couriers when I was out really working hard to promote the product, you know, flying air shows myself. And that was the other thing. You fly your airplanes to the air shows. I mean, you, you've yes, been to Oshkosh, you've been to Florida. I mean, we even had that little uh, single cylinder trike and it lived 28 horsepower. Yeah, that yeah, flew yeah. Flew it all the way from Hayes, Kansas. Yeah, we flew. Uh, we That's been our tradition. Uh, when we, we did trailer for a brief period there and we learned how much we did not like trailering. And trailering's risky to everybody because uh, you're putting the plane together in an air show environment and everybody's trying to help you and it's a good place to forget something critical so it's just best to, to make the planes uh, cross-country capable and they're very enjoyable planes to fly cross-country and as a result you the customer get a better deal because we actually use the airplanes extensively and uh, we maintain about nine to thirteen hangar uh, airplanes in our hangars typically and that we operate and try to have one of everything for our customers to come by and demo so yeah we're real live and in the air uh, this airplane is uh, front and back seating. Now, is there a, any adjustment for height of the pilot uh, for a flying airplane? Like, I'm 5'6", you're well over 6 feet tall. The panel's actually low enough that we don't... We've never had a customer who couldn't see over the panel. I mean, you'd have to be extremely uh, short. Uh, we've had some guys push the limits on the headroom, and because of that, we've changed the, what we call the headache structure over to an open Y system rather than the diagonal that went typically across. Or you had, your head always had to be at one side if you had a Well, yeah, you'd have to be lopsided, you know, either uh, Democratic <laughs> or Republic. But, uh, but now you can go clear up in here, and then we've got guys 6'6", six, six, uh, buying and flying. So, And there's some things you can do with the seat. This has uh, different cushions, different wedges uh, that allow more room in the cockpit. So it, it's been a very accommodating aircraft. I'm uh, 5'10". And I actually got the seat uh, all the way forward, and that's just about right for me. Okay, so the seat is adjustable then? Yes, it is. It has about uh, two and a half inches range. Tracy, our demo pilot, is a lot shorter, but she's also able to fit in this airplane just as it, as it is right here without even a cushion. So it's very accommodating. Now, the way you get that is you have a, what we call a lot of knee drop. In other words, if your knee is uh, fairly vertical in the seat, then you can tolerate a lot of different body sizes rather than having the pedals outstretched and your legs flat. So. Now, we're down here in Florida, and you've got the doors open. Can you fly it with the doors open? Uh, the certified version's approved for flight with one door only open, and you have to open it at or below 60 and don't exceed 100. But uh, the experimental version, same exact airplane, less stringent certification requirements, you can go ahead and fly both doors open. Um, it's, it's fine that way. It's pretty windy for the rear seater. Control system-wise, we're uh, standard uh, stick and rudder style of control. Yep. Yeah, it's all cables on your uh, roll, and then you have push-pull tubes here, and then cables on your rudder. And how are the flaps activated? You got a lever under the seat, and it's a manual Johnson bar. It's a real high ratio uh, gearing, so you actually can pull it down. And we have an inertia reel here to allow you to move around in the cockpit to get down there to get that. Because we've, we've tried, I'll tell you, before that inertia reel, we tried every place we could think of to put that flap lever to get to without, but that's the only spot that it actually works. So <clears throat> That's probably one of the things, we've, one of the few things about the courier we had criticism is the flap lever location. So. Now, could it be used for a, a training environment? Is it a dual uh, 
uh, throttle system and so on yeah. and forth to the back? Yeah, you got dual throttle and you have dual rudder pedals and dual brakes, all standard. And this one, I believe, no, but you can get an option where you have dual trim, which is kind of nice because the instructor is going to be in the back and uh, it's nice for him to be able to override the trim system. You're flying this down from Hayes, Kansas. You've got a fair uh, storage area in behind that rear seat, by the looks of it. Yeah, you can put about, um, I think that's about nine, nine or seven cubic feet, and it runs 50 pounds. And then if you're flying solo, of course, you can put a bunch of stuff in the rear seat as well. Now, I'm a float plane pilot. How hard is it to, or difficult is it to put floats on this? It comes with uh, little bushings and things on the airframe. You can't see them, but you have to poke through like that here. At what we call station three is a uh, welded on fitting that allows you to bolt on the cluster attachment point back there and then you just remove the gear and plug in your system to the forward uh, or to the main gear and it's a very popular float plane it uh we've had guys who had super cubs and have uh, gotten couriers and uh, they actually like the performance of the 100 horsepower courier over the 180 horsepower super cubs so. if we were to take this airplane in a kit form how long would it take the average person to get it from delivery to the store to actually have it up and flying? In the standard kit, you're going to probably spend a thousand hours. We've heard as high as 1,200. Some of these people buy a kit and unbelievably will assemble the entire airplane before covering it, test run the engine and take it back apart and go through the process of covering it and putting it all back together again, which adds several hundreds of hours beyond me why they do this it, it they're buying a kit that's been built there's over 500 of these out there so yes it is going to go together the way we say in the book so build it that way and you'll have the build times that we advertise if you don't build it that way then yeah you'll be way off the board on your build time but i would expect a thousand hours if it's standard and half that if you go with quick build and you know partial kits it's anybody's guess now is there any jigging or special tooling that's going to be required to finish one off absolutely none the aircraft either comes with all the little bits and pieces we even give you like cleco pliers and clecos uh, not very many but just enough to get you started and uh, it's pretty much what we call self jigging and that's uh, well you need a couple of saw horses you can assemble the wings on saw horses the alignment's not critical uh, if you look down here you got an adjustable lift strut, and that's what sets your wing twist, your washout and your wing. So you don't need to worry about when you build a wing, it's gonna be fine, just relatively level on saw horses is good. Your fuselage comes 100% pre-welded. You can even buy the fuselage uh, sandblasted and primed, so you're ready to go straight to fixing, uh, preparing it for cover. And uh, so, the self jigging aspect nature of it and the very precise aspect of the kit really facilitate building it. And RANS has been successful because so many of our planes do get completed. We probably have a high 90 some percent completion ratio. And it's all, and it's all how we designed the kit to be built. You were one of the first uh, people to actually come up with a very concise building manual. I mean, I got that first manual and it had to be like four or five inches thick, and, and yet you we're still updating it almost on a regular basis. Yeah, there's no, the process is kind of unique to uh, manual writing. There is no stop and start revision dates. It's a constant ongoing process, so you may get uh, updates to your manual after you get your manual if there's something changing. But what it does mean is that the manual for your airplane is unique and you want to keep it. Uh, we're not talking major changes. We're talking small refinements and things like that. If there is anything that's pertinent to aircraft safety, we put out an AOA, uh, aircraft uh, operational alert or an assembly alert or a airworthiness alert. We do all those different types of alerts voluntarily. Our primary thing is to keep the airplane safe. And uh, if it's a process change or some situation that comes up in the uh, assembly of the aircraft, we'll let you know and let everybody know if it affects their aircraft and that serial number that it affects. So you're well taken care of. So if somebody wanted to get more information on you, Randy, what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? Uh, Rands.com works really good. And uh, yeah, we'll just Google Rands. It'll come up. Uh, we're pretty popular on the Internet. We're just right off of I-70, just uh, about a three-quarter mile. And that's at uh, 4600 uh, Highway 183 Alternate, Hayes, Kansas. And uh, we have a phone number, too. It's 785-625-6346. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for your time. You betcha.